this week's Cardiology Countdown, we'll begin with an overview of how to manage antithrombotic therapy periprocedural uh, interventions. And so uh, putting in ICDs and pacemakers in patients who are taking aspirin, dual antiplatelet therapy, warfarin anticoagulation, how should that be managed? In theory, one would want to get off therapy, hold that for the uh, period of, uh, of intervention, uh, and then resume it, but uh, there really aren't good data or strategies for that. And so an overview looked at 13 different studies that reported uh, bleeding complication rates with the various uh, therapies compared with those patients who were on no uh, antithrombotic therapy. And not surprisingly, any of the various antithrombotic therapies increased the risk of bleeding. But the one real standout were patients who had been on warfarin, who had a heparin bridging strategy, uh, peri uh, intervention. And this had an eightfold higher risk of bleeding. Now, some of this may be observational, but uh, really did stand out um, as compared with simply continuing warfarin alone, that did not appear to increase the risk of bleeding significantly. And so this has um, suggested that continuing warfarin anticoagulation may be a suitable approach to device implantation. At the number two spot is a study called FISH. The uh, FISH oil in um, stenosis for hemodialysis grafts, a little bit tortured acronym, but uh, one that aptly looked at FISH oil in a randomized study of patency of hemodialysis grafts. This was a, a small study, just 200 patients, and they looked at graft failure uh, requiring intervention, didn't see a significant uh, reduction in the primary endpoint as defined, but did see about half the risk of thrombosis or intervention uh, individually and a, uh, a lower rate of cardiovascular events, even in that modest number of patients. And so a small study, but one that uh, is a growing drumbeat of studies showing the benefits of fish oil. And at this week's number one spot is a, uh, a sobering trial of children with uh, diabetes, age 10 to 17, with type 2 diabetes. That is the diabetes epidemic that we all fear. Uh, a study that looked at um, the use of metformin, lifestyle intervention, or rosiglitazone, the PPAR agonist, um, and uh, looked at glycemic control after a six-month period. They found that metformin was um, associated with uh, sustained glycemic control, but that um, the lifestyle intervention alone really didn't uh, do the trick. And uh, on the other hand, adding rosiglitazone, uh, not surprisingly, had improved uh, glycemic control. Now, out of all of this, I think the most sobering thing is that uh, youth can develop type 2 diabetes requiring one and two drug therapies and in whom lifestyle intervention really does not appear to be that successful, at least as practiced uh, currently. And so a call to action for all of us to try and focus on obesity and the root causes of type 2 diabetes in youth, and then the need to examine what are the best therapies uh, going forward for the then long term. Uh, for this week's Cardiology Countdown, I'm Chris Cannon. 